started. Okay, I ain't, I don't even need to introduce David Wright because that's why you're here. There he is. Everybody that's over there. If there's a way you can move this way, because you can't see the screen from over there, I'm sorry to say, but if there's a way you can move this way, you can see it better. <coughs> see what's on this screen and listen to what I have to say. But anyway, I want to welcome everybody tonight in this new 2018 series, started a series from the uh, Walter Durham Library Series. And uh, appreciate you coming down here tonight. I think we've got an interesting story to tell here. I'm going to talk about Camp Douglas, which is a Union prisoner war camp in Chicago. And the second part of this is going to be the making of the documentary for the History Channel, 80 Acres of Hell, in which we filmed in four locations, and two of those locations are in Gallatin. So you're going to get to see not only some locations that we filmed in Gallatin at Kennesaw Farms and at Rosemont, but Quite a few of our members out here in the crowd are actors who are in that film. You're going to get to see them as they appear as Confederate and Union soldiers during the making of this film. What surprised me tonight and shouldn't be surprised is how I look at all of them after 13 years later. They don't look older, they just look cleaner. <laughs> we went out of our way to make these soldiers look as they were prisoner of war. Dirty, filthy, skinny. We selected them for those reasons, and they do look good. <laughs> but I would like, before we even start, because this film is about Gallatin, it's about 80 acres of hell, but it's also about these men who are actors in this film. I like everybody in here, and I don't want to overlook anybody who is in the film, just stand up and let people see you, because there's two reasons. You're going to look at them tonight, look at them closely, and then see what they look like in the film. Jonathan Eby and uh, Charles, not Charles, Gary. brother Gary, Gary Spencer. <laughs> and there's a bunch more that just couldn't make it tonight. But thanks for all of them coming tonight. And thank you all for coming. Now, I'm going to start the program. I'm going to go back here to the camera and we'll kick it in here. As I said, I'm going to open with a short history of the Camp Douglas itself. And Camp Douglas is in Chicago. And at the bright break of the Civil War, all of a sudden, with the fall of Fort Donaldson in February of 1862, they captured 5,000 Confederate prisoners and they didn't have any place to send them. Prisoner war camps hadn't even been started at that time, so what do you do with 5,000 men? Which, of course, as the war went on, this is going to grow into many, many, many thousands of men on both sides. The importance of Fort Donaldson to Sumner and Robertson County was Many soldiers who went to Fort Donaldson got captured and were sent to Camp Douglas. We have one in our crowd tonight who is a descendant of, trying to think of his, Elmore Green, who was sent to Camp Douglas, and we've even got a photograph of Elmore Green at Camp Douglas, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So that touch between being at Fort uh, Donaldson, getting captured right after they went there, in fact, they trained at Red Bull in spring, went straight to Fort Donaldson. A week, two weeks later, they were captured and sent to Camp Douglas, and that started their reign of terror. If you were lucky enough not to be killed outright, you wound up being these guys right here, very possibly. These are soldiers who had just arrived at Camp Douglas. Now, I want you to look at this photograph very clearly and look at the men in this photograph. The look they have, the appearance of their clothing that they have, the variety of clothing they're wearing, not all uniforms as we would think every soldier would be, but this shows you what the real Confederate soldier looked like, not necessarily in 1862, but these, these men were sent to Camp Douglas a little bit later, I think 1864. But this was as they arrived in Chicago, made just before they were incarcerated at Camp Douglas. Now this is another photograph of Camp Douglas prisoners of war, and this is the 48th Tennessee. The 30th Tennessee and the 48th were sent to Camp Douglas. Here again, these men were captured there and sent up there in March of 1862. So you had this prison in Chicago that's receiving these men, and this 
drawing, this engraving, is in April of 1862 of Camp Douglas. The only difference in what happened is unusual that I've understood is that Camp Douglas was originally a Union training camp for Union soldiers. The barracks were built, the soldiers were trained there, and then they were sent off to combat. So when the Confederate soldiers were sent to Camp Douglas, there were no fences around it. There were only barracks. It was not a prisoner of war camp as such. It was a training camp. This caused some real unusual circumstances for the events that took place later on. <coughs> Photograph of officers at Camp Douglas. Notice the houses in the background. That's very important. This is a drawing in Harper's Ferry, in Harper Ferry Harper's Weekly that shows an interior of one of the barracks at Camp Douglas. I seriously doubt if the artist was ever there because this is the most absurd drawing of the show. They talk about the barracks at that time being two stories high with bunks, three bunks high. I don't think they would have allowed any bunk to have a six foot clearance between it. But the main thing that you don't see in this drawing, this engraving is, each barracks had up to 120 men stuffed into it. And that doesn't show that with one stove and in those Chicago winters that created a real problem for the men here's another photograph of the men the barracks behind them these are the listed men look how many there are bear the the uh, camp became terribly overcrowded as more and more prisoners were sent there another engraving that shows in Harper's Weekly one of the Confederate soldiers did drawings while he was there this was called wash day <coughs> Then in late 1862, all of the Confederate prisoners were paroled back to their units, and the camp then became another training camp for Union soldiers. And this is a photograph made of that particular one. After the Union soldiers, which are called the Invalid Corps, came there to train, the Invalid Corps was made up of wounded soldiers who were taken out of combat till they recovered, and then they were sent back to their units. Well, when you get into the documentary, this is covered in more depth and you'll see what happened. But the main important thing about that was they burned the buildings down at Camp Douglas. And here's a drawing made by the same Confederate soldier of the buildings burned. Apparently he was still there. He must not have got paroled because he did these drawings on own location. This Colonel Sweet came in a little later on and the corruption and the, I'm just going to read you a few notes that I had here about what went on at Camp Douglas, which to make it called 80 acres of hell, was that the uh, it was one of the largest POW camps in all of the Union War, but nobody uh, knew at the time what was going on there. 5,000 men sent there, they had one water hydrant for all 5,000 men. <laughs> that was a major, major problem, and Tom Cartwright will get into that in the documentary a little later on camp was meant for no more than 6,000 prisoners, but it grew to 12,000, so that's the over, overcrowdedness. Poor sanitation, spread diseases, dysentery, smallpox, typhoid, fever, tuberculosis, and that became the leading cause of death at Camp Douglas, was disease. However, in addition to that, there was the uh, cruelty, the torture, the uh, shortage of food, the the uh, taking away of blankets, the uh, food was shorted, it was sold off by corrupt contractors, inferior food was delivered, there were no stoves in some barracks. If a prisoner was found to have two blankets, they took both of them away from him. Clothing and money that was sent to prisoners was stolen by the camp in many cases. Prisoners were shot while picking up wood for their stoves. These are just some of the things that are recorded about Camp Douglas. One man was shot for urinating outside of his barracks. Men were chained outside in winter without blankets, and prisoners were made to drop their pants whole barracks at a time and sit in the snow until their bodies froze to the ground. Now you just wonder what was going on in a Union prison camp that would cause that kind of treatment to prisoners of war. Lack of food, poor housing, the water hydrant. Tom Cartwright brings this out in the documentary and makes it a little bit clearer than what what I'm talking about, but Colonel Sweet, he was the one of all of the commandants at Camp Douglas, he was the worst of all of them, and you'll hear more about him later. This particular is just one of the cruelty uh, things that they did to prisoners there, it was called riding the horse, we'll see that in the documentary. 
Now, one interesting thing, and I'm getting back to Elmore Green here, was there was a camp photographer. He had a studio there. His name was Brandon. And the neat thing about Mr. Brandon was he photographed Confederate soldiers. And this, such as this one on the top, you're going to see him again. These are just some of the photographs made by him. This is James Hyde at the top. Look at him standing there in his frock coat beside a chair. This is Elmore Green, Private Elmore Green right here. And uh, he was born in Gallatin, just a short history on him, 1835, and he died in 1844 from a fall from a horse. He was only 49 years old. He joined Morgan's Cavalry and was captured at Buffington Island in July of 63 and sent to Camp Douglas and spent the rest of the war there, and then he returned to Gallatin after the war. Uh, Billy Green is a descendant of his, and Debbie is here, who's the wife of Dan Green, who is a descendant of his, too. And uh, the fact that we've got one of the photographs of him is just really, really rewarding. Now look at the two photographs of Elmore Green on the left, on the right, and Hyde, James Hyde on the chair, the photograph, the frock coats. Though they're not the same coats, we found out from other photographs that probably these men had clothing there, the photographer had clothing there that they dressed these men up in to make them look decent because some of these photographs you see of these men are just ragged as they can be. And this is going to tie into a letter that I have from Elmore Green, some of the letters at home, and just real briefly I'm going to read some things he says in his letters that make you believe they did not want their family to know what was going on at Camp Douglas. Okie doke. Jeff, Chumming, Jeff Cummings' cheeks are as rosy as his sis Matilda's used to be. I seriously doubt that. <coughs> he mentions being cold and sick, but goes very little depth about the conditions at the camp. He only asks for cotton tick to sleep on. Stout, lasting pocket handkerchief. And there'll be one reason, be the reason why he didn't want to relate the bad conditions in the camp. All the letters that they wrote were read and censored by the Union Army, so anything that hinted at cruelty, obviously bad living conditions, inefficient food, insufficient food, more were probably scratched out of the letters, or the men probably were reprimanded for even writing that. So they wouldn't have written anything that might have got them in trouble to do that. I can remember even at this, and I'll relate this to myself. During my year spent in Vietnam, I did not write home to my parents any things that uh, I thought might bother them. Why would you do that? You don't want to worry your family. My take is these soldiers weren't any different than soldiers in the 60s, 1770s, or any time of that. But to know that what they endured was way beyond what probably most people endured in prison camps at that time of that. So to have a nice insight into Private Elmore Green, I think, is really a, a neat thing for us to do. This photograph is of Andersonville, and you've probably all heard of Andersonville too. Not a lot of people have heard of Camp Douglas, but everybody's heard of Andersonville because of those horrible living conditions there and the high death rate at Andersonville. And obviously from looking at this, you can see how terrible, terrible the conditions were, and I certainly wouldn't want to demean that camp to make think Camp Douglas was as bad as that. But it's interesting that the death rate at Andersonville where they had no food because the Confederates had no food. The guards had to eat the same food apparently that the, the prisoners did. They had no housing and uh, they lived under those conditions basically the same as the guards outside the camp. They had a 28 percent death rate there and Camp Douglas had a 17 to 23 percent death rate. So now we're going to talk about the, the documentary. And I've got some moving footage in this one, and this is a pretty graphic film, so it's made to point out what went on at Camp Douglas. It is a place long forgotten, a site of calculated humiliation and torture on a scale unknown in American history. Six thousand dead all victims of a systematic and carefully orchestrated policy of retribution ordered by the highest government authorities are mute testimony to the worst of human nature. 
This place is a Union prisoner of war camp near Chicago, labeled by one observer as an extermination camp. What happened here resulted in an entire city being put in lockdown. This is an American nightmare, a forgotten place called Camp Douglas, named by its victims as 80 acres of hell. Now, I was the art director on this film, and it was made for the History Channel, and it ran one hour. Okay, now, Gary Foreman and Carolyn Foreman were the producer, Gary was the director, and Native Sun Productions was the production company. And I've worked for them for several different productions, both documentaries and for films for other sites, uh, such as historic sites, Cumberland Gap, and so on. I want to give you a real quick dose of what goes into making a documentary. We're not making a major motion picture here at all. You're talking about one hour to two hour films usually. Sometimes I have a series and more. But what you're also talking about, especially with the History Channel, is a very low budget. Now here's some comparisons for you. And let me do say this right off the bat. What you're seeing on these video outtakes is off of YouTube on the computer. And I apologize for this because this film shot in high definition. Foreman shoots all his films in high def and they're just beautifully done. But I couldn't get my D DVD cuts out of it, so I had to go to a YouTube, and the quality is just terrible here. I really, I'm sorry to have to do that, but moving footage and seeing that's better than listening to me talk. So I thought you'd rather have that than me. So as you see these, you're going to see what's going on, but quality is not all that good. Okay, we're back to making a documentary. History Channel paid their, their uh, suppliers to produce a documentary to them for a set fee. In this case, one hour is $250,000. Two hours is $500,000. That sounds like a lot of money, but it's not. I worked on Last of the Mohicans where I met Gary. What was it, an hour and 10 minutes, an hour and 20 minutes? $40 million. And, to that, and today, that's nothing for a movie at all to do that. A lot of movies, good movies, were made less than that, but just that one film was for. So you're talking about major motion pictures costing multi, multi that. But even within the documentary production uh, camp, PBS, Public Broadcasting Service, budgets generally a million dollars for an hour. So History Channel has a very low budget to bring it into. And Gary made numerous documentaries for History Channel on for about 10 years after he went, came back from Last of the Mohicans, and they were good. I worked on PBS films, I worked on History Channel films, and I worked for some other producers and was in Last of the Mohicans seeing what they did there too. And I gotta say that Gary Foreman gets more out of his people and money work than any other film I've ever went on. He gets more out of his money producing it than anybody else I've worked with. I have an only good thing to say about him and Carolyn and their production of their film. Run very well, very knowledgeable about what he does, and even to the point of he paid his actors in this film and others too the same union scale that they paid for major motion pictures at that time, which was $125 a day. I made $75 a day when I worked on Last of the Mohicans. Uh, some of the fellows in this room worked on uh, Gods and Generals and maybe even Gettysburg and they got a t-shirt and a hat. Is that right? <laughs> right? That's true, isn't it? Okay. So he was paying his extras, his actors, union scale basically. But he was not union. So we go from there. This is Gary and this is Carolyn. And this is me when I was working on Mohican. The only reason I'm throwing this in here is that's not Gary on the left there, but that's where I met Gary and that's where we got to talking about the film business and why he was there and why I was there. And that started a relationship that's going on even to this day, which I'm glad to say. So I've worked, as I said, I've worked with him on others. This is a Daniel Boone film that we shot for the uh, Cumberland Gap National Park. And here again, our crew is a small crew, maybe 10, eight to 10 people, Buried from time to time. You had Gary as the director. You had 
I'd use sometimes one cameraman, sometimes two cameramen, what it took, whatever it meant. Uh, Morgan did everything. We all did everything. I'll tell you what, there was no single thing that anybody did. If you were on that set, you did everything, except for the cameramen who were union. <laughs> <laughs> cameramen and the gaffers did camera and gaffing and nothing else. The rest of us did everything. And that goes for the art director too, but that's what made ours work. Makeup, that's my son there too, Sean. He was in one of the scenes for it. And there's always, I'm gonna say, fun times too. There's a, a lot of times it's long and tedious days as we've all found out, but there's also breaks. And this horse was always smiling. He was the happiest horse I'd ever saw in my life. But <laughs> Gary, Stopped long enough to let me take a picture of you and the horse. That's Gary on the left, the horse is on the right. <laughs> but usually documentaries are made with a, a format that's basically the same for all of them, and that is made up of using vintage photographs, uh, vintage uh, paintings, uh, letters, maps, uh, moving footage, stills from reenactors, modern, modern day stills talking heads as we call them and these are experts in their field who usually talk about and can tell you what's going on in a particular scene. This one in particular one Thomas Cartwright and I show Thomas here because there were three talking heads on 80 Acres of Hell. <clears throat> one of them was the author of the book 80 Acres of Hell, Mr. Levy, and the other one I can't remember, well there were four actually, but Thomas is down here in Franklin. He was at the Carter House at the time, director and he's at the Loach House right now, one of the most knowledgeable, well-spoken men for, for uh, Civil War history I've ever seen. You're gonna to get to see a lot of him too here. So, for five long years, we're gonna go into the film now. Human conscience were cast aside. Many civilians were arrested in this whole fraudulent uh, situation. And they were tried by military tribunal. One man committed This was shot at Rosemont, by the way. Another man was sentenced to death as a result of this military tribunal. Okay, we're back to Camp Douglas. We're gonna establish the start of Camp Douglas and these photographs because the next few photographs are gonna show you what we did to make it look like Camp Douglas. Our first location is Connor Prairie, Indiana. And if you look at this young Union off soldier standing in this field, the reason he's standing there, I didn't get to make a photograph. Sometimes I can take photographs and sometimes I'm busy and can't take them, but I took one of him, but I gathered this one up, and what's behind him is a big field. Now this Connor Prairie is on a hill overlooking a big flat bottom land, and that bottom land extends forever left and right, maybe 50, 60, 80 acres. But in that bottom land, what you look at was we was on this hill shooting down into that field, empty field, and we put people out there moving around. It was gridded off, and this is the way you go about doing what we call CGI, which is computer graphic imagery. And it was gridded off, and these men were out there in that field moving around at special, special locations. That purpose was so we could do CGI on Camp Douglas. This scene here was uh, taken out of uh, War of 1812, First Invasion. When we shot that film, it was nighttime, totally black field out there. All of these people were running around with a few lights on them to light them up. But behind them was totally black field. You can see some trees back out there. When that scene was finished, it was sent off to Texas. The CGI guys built that, it, that building of the White House and burned it. And it was so real, you just couldn't believe that it was, wasn't real. Of course, we didn't have a White House to burn. We didn't have the budget to build a White House. So it's all done graphically and in Star Wars all of the days movies that have all these things going on is probably 90 percent CGI but there you go the same field with the buildings now in it and the men in the film you'll see this in a month they're all moving around so it's a real place there now with buildings in it there it is again with snow on it when we did the winter scenes so CGI is just taking filmmaking to a whole nother level over what it was when I first got on it back in the 90s and there wasn't hardly anything being done at that point. The numbers are simply staggering. Of the 214,000 Confederate soldiers who go north to Union prisons, 26,000, or about 12%, will die. These rebel prisoner deaths alone outnumber the number of Americans killed in all of the nation's previous wars combined. 
Now I'm going to warn you, there's, there's really graphic images throughout this program for a purpose. Now listen to what Tom says. But it is a testimony to cruelty, barbarism, and I earned the title, The Andersonville of the North. Okay, we're filming now, and here's the crew. There you got a gaffer, you got Gary, and you got a cameraman. And some of the scenes we shot up at Connor Prairie were the death scenes, where the burial scenes were, and what we did with them to try to duplicate the scene. And, then, and this is, there again, this is in the film footage, but these are my stills that I made when, while they were filming and setting it all up. We also filmed some of the buildings at Connor Prairie, which is a delightful, historic little town if you ever get a chance to go up there outside of Indianapolis. And uh, there's Gary giving directions to somebody on the ground out there. I have a feeling I can't quite see who he's pointing at, but Michael Agee's not in his direct fire, so you missed that one, Mike. <laughs> so anyway, but here's one there. That there's always somebody to <laughs> find something to do in his spare time. Well, you were in a barn, weren't you, Mike, and you found that cat down there? <laughs> well, the cat found you. I don't remember. <laughs> it looks like Morris the cat, doesn't it? But we're going back to this photograph then of these men. You're looking at these men, the look they got, what kind of appearance they got, and I'm just going to show you some stills from some of the people that we used in our films. Our job was to make them look dirty, worn out. A lot of them worked on it themselves pretty well. Come up with really beat up good clothes. And all of the folks, for the most part, furnished their own clothing too. We had some costume, wardrobe, but most of these fellows all turned out with their own stuff. And that's the reason they're so good, because they were good at the time when Glenn King showed up. Glenn King looked like he had been in a prison camp all his life. <laughs> uh, he looks great there, doesn't he? Unfortunately, Glenn couldn't come tonight. I wish he could have. But if they can get that look in their face, Blake Stewart, Blake, are you here somewhere? I thought he was coming tonight. He's from Gallatin. Dave Fagerberg out of Missouri. A low stockade. Here's some information on Camp Douglas. Acres of land holding 8,000 Union recruits and 2,000 horses. Of course, uh, with 8,000 men, that's going to be somewhere in the range of about 3,000 gallons of urine a day from the men and with the horses probably about 28,000 gallons of urine a day and about 15 tons of manure a day. The prairie ground could not hold this filth. Now remember, they had one water hydrant. The first 5,000 rebel prisoners of war arrive at Camp Douglas on February 21st, 1862. The weather is miserable. They were extremely cold. They had boarded the Illinois Central Railroad, and that's the reason Camp Douglas began, was because of the railroad. And from there, sent in the cars close to Chicago, a detachment of Union cavalry was throwing bricks at the train, injured prisoners. And citizens were there to greet the Confederate soldiers, lined up on the streets, calling them devils. And um, they're, they're instruments of Jeff Davis and uh, ignorant, pitiful devils. And ladies were cursing them. One Confederate soldier said, All ladies acted better than that. So the first two or three thousand prisoners were adequately housed. Overcrowding became the real problem. There were too many prisoners for too few places. Uh, inadequate stoves, inadequate blankets, a lack of medical care, and soon the number of prisoners just completely overwhelmed the resources that were allocated Camp Douglas would change from early, middle to late war, but uh, generally there were 16 rows of barracks, 40 each row, which would build 64 barracks. And in these barracks, and uh, that's stretching it mildly, uh, they're calling barracks, planks of wood, tar paper on the top, uh, approximately 150, 200 men would be, would, would be crammed in each barracks and uh, would sleep two to three to a bunk together to keep warm. And uh, they, like this- A lot of these are shot at Kennesaw. Off of Lake Michigan. Yeah. Uh, that would just cut through these Southerners that were not used to this climate. One Southerner said it was the coldest climate he'd ever been in his life. How could people live here? 
Now there's lighter sides to it too, and this is this next series, this this cuts coming out of the video, you're gonna have a relief from all of the bad stuff going on. And it involves Michael Agee as the star here, and he does a really good job of playing his part. Initially, the relationship between the citizens and the rebel soldiers is not always antagonistic. Visitors often intermingle with the prisoners on the grounds. And another officer was walking through the camp with uh, a lady, and uh, for some reason, uh, this lady uh, kissed the soldier on the cheek. And after that, the soldiers went, said, Gangway, move out of the way, artillery coming through, and let them pass through. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Michael played his part well. I think he figured Hollywood would be calling soon after that. <laughs> and they may have very well. But anyway, these are my stills that I made basically. I was standing behind the cameraman, so they were very, very close to it. Same position. And then we moved to Big Springs, Kentucky. And uh, here again, cameraman shooting lots of soldiers lined up. Union soldiers coming in. This is the Invalid Corps supposedly coming into town. Now, because you've got a small cast, and I say small cast, we had 70, 80 men. How many did we have, Jonathan? Somewhere around that. Men and women both, and some children too on our, working on these. A lot of people is going to show up being both sides of the fence. They were Yankees in some, and they were Confederates in others. And in some cases, they were, as, where you at, Johnny? Johnny was a Confederate soldier for uh, most of the film, but then he wound up being a Yankee you know, supplier of stuff, and he got taken to, well, to court over anyway. Played a lot of different parts. And as you can see here with Michael and Jerry Wooten, next thing, they were both Confederate prisoners. Ike Gatlin is a Confederate, then he became a Yankee when he got to Gallatin. There he is sitting on the porch at Rosemont. Uh, and in the middle of that, you see Mike Copeland as a Yankee soldier, and then Mike becomes a drunk. <laughs> Once outside the camp, the POWs visit the innumerable flesh pots of Chicago. That's Mike on the left. Rebel prisoners are often found strolling down Well Street. <laughs> The camp never had adequate security measures that lured prisoners or almost encouraged prisoners to try to make an escape. So, uh, to begin with, it wasn't very difficult to get out of Camp Douglas. Remember, they said they didn't have any fences. So they'd walk out. They'd go down to downtown to the bars in Chicago. And in Levy's book, he talks about the Chicago people welcomed the Confederate soldiers because they were better managing themselves than the Yankees were who caused a whole lot more trouble. Well, they had to build a fence. They couldn't let them do that. And obviously, there's like times for the crew, too. You know, we have to be showing off doing some things as well. Okay, here's some of our cast. Paul Caudill, and of course, that was Nathan. There, there again, Glenn King, Michael A.G., Gary Spencer, and Glenn King's daughter, Chelsea, who shows up later on in the film. We did some battle scenes, working them into it. There's a cameraman filming that. Makeup again with Carolyn doing some bloody makeup and her bloody finger. <laughs> and Debbie, she was always good. She was makeup too. She was good at what she did. It's human nature, however, to find some sort of entertainments. Uh, prisoners could and Paul Caudill is in this, and Paul is a musician. He and Kim are both musicians and played a lot of different historic events, and they'll be at Bledsoe's in about two weeks. Checkers, the chess was a favorite if they could get all the pieces or substitute pieces. Uh, marbles, a game that for most children is lost today, uh, but was uh, very much enjoyed by the prisoners because it helped pass the time. They would fly kites, and the Federal Guards found this amusing until they found out that messages were on the kites that were flying, and the kites would never come back because they were going to let go. And they stopped that practice as well. When they weren't working and, and taking care of camp duties, uh, they would spend time, uh, you know, playing games of chance. And of course, they would, uh, you know, bet match sticks and other types of things in order to win stakes at poker. And they would play games and play music. Uh, this was the only way that they possibly had to while away the idle hours. Had fun, our loving prospered well. It was a code of chivalry, is that the musicians that were captured 
were allowed to keep their instruments and they would have concerts. Some favorite songs is Lorena, uh, The Vacant Chair, The Girl I Left Behind Me, a good Irish tune. And this that would keep, of course, their spirits up. Okay, now one incident that happened in the the uh, history of Camp Douglas. This is a woman, and she's being examined by a Yankee guard. And this is unusual that this happened, so it's going to be shown in this next clip. There we have cameraman filming from a different angle. These are called steady cams. When they have these cameras that they mount on their body, they refer to them as steady cams because they can carry them and they have a gyro in them to balance them, but they still can move them around, carry them with them, and take them as opposed to a mounted one on a tripod, which you had seen earlier. And so, lax security has allowed dozens of prisoners to escape. Tucker calls upon the Chicago Police Department to step in and conduct a security sweep of the camp. The prisoners view the police as even more corrupt than the guards. Prisoner William Barrow voiced the sentiments of many. The Yanks came with police from Chicago and went around in the prisoners' quarters. They took watches, money, rings, cigars, and clothes. The police robbers came through our ranks and searched us, taking pocket knives and money. Yet Corporal Barrow's tale of stolen property is incomplete. The police officers also confiscate hundreds of knives, 60 packages of gunpowder, and several pistols. Tucker tightens security, placing two hired spies among the prisoners. They make a startling discovery. Colonel Tucker did not trust the camp guards to do a good search. He would bring in Chicago police to search the barracks for contraband, uh, for weapons, and they discovered the eight women and the child. They've been prisoners of Camp Douglas for about a So they discovered women at Camp Douglas, and they gave all of the women, the three or four or five of them, I think there was, the option of leaving or leaving. <laughs> and two of them stayed. <laughs> but they became washwomen, and they, they didn't, uh, weren't, so, weren't incarcerated as soldiers, but two of them went back to their uh, home. And these are some of the women who were in the film, too. That's Vonda on the right and Chelsea, and I don't know the other two ladies' names at this time. Then we moved to Gallatin, Tennessee, and filmed here twice, once at Kennesaw Farms and once at Rosemont. And there's Kennesaw in its old days. You remember that? Boy, boy, what a neat farm. It was a racehorse farm, as you recall. This is before it became under development. But it was right at that edge, that edge of starting development, and Tim and Kim, Kim Weaver, Lois, Lois Weaver, allowed us to go on Kennesaw and do something that really made an important part of the whole film. The horse barn, magnificent barn, was just about to be demolished. They were going to push it over and burn it. So we asked them if we could burn it instead for the film, and Tim agreed. And we learned a lot about burning a barn, but that barn <laughs> served us also as doing several different sets. We set about, Mike Copeland was our carpenter head, Set about building walls and gates and uh, hospital rooms. We turned the barn into several different sets, as you'll see later on in this. But we got to, with all of that filming, finished it up, we burned the sucker to the ground. <laughs> and boy, if you've never burned a barn that big, get ready for something, because we learned a lot right there. Here's looking down one of the, the aisles. Horse stalls on both sides. That's another one. Another part of it. You can see what kind of condition it was in. It hadn't been used for a long time. And then this room here, which you're going to see in just a moment, transformed into a completely different looking room. And the loft, which plays in an important scene that we set up too later as on. I'll go back to that. When you're making these films, there's lots of downtime. You can work from daylight to dark, and maybe sometimes after dark. But in that, setting up scenes, moving people around, getting all the direction done, there's a lot of hurry up and wait. And these guys, had to entertain themselves and a whole lot of the time. Our food was catered. Remember La Riviere's? Rene, La Riviere. They catered our food, did a great job for it. Everybody was just like pet coons. They were ready for the, the caterers to get there when they showed up. We all were. 
Yeah. They did a great job, but there's a lot of downtime, and you see the boys just taking breaks there. This is another little building that was there. It's going to be bulldozed over too, and it played a part in some sets that's coming it's up. It's interesting that soldiers that have been in combat or normal soldiers respected each other, even if they were prisoners. But this changed when they brought in the Invalid Corps. Okay, the Invalid Corps is the Yankees that came in after they had paroled the Confederates in 1862. These guys were been wounded, they were out of combat, they were being recuperating, so they put them into a corps to put them all somewhere until they could re recuperate and go back. They were troublemakers, obviously, as Tom talks about, but here's some scenes of the Invalid Corps. And this is where the barn gets burned. Not burned by the Confederates, it's burned by the Invalid Corps because they didn't want to stay in the buildings. The Union troops refused to stay in the prison barracks, setting up camp outside the camp line. They also refused to drill, clean the camp, or perform picket duty, citing the cartel ban on parolee military duty. Tyler responds by calling in regular army troops to control the parolees. The response is swift and brutal. So many of them uh, mutinied and tried to burn down the camp. The people of Chicago were terrified of what was happening at Camp Douglas. The biggest fire in the history of the camp was started by the New York troops. They tried to burn their way out. Um, it took all... Now I want to say one thing about the burning of the farm. This is what I'm talking about, learning about burning down big buildings. I've never been an arsonist, so this is the first time I ever encountered actually setting a fire to a major building and burning it down. And I didn't set the fire. We got the fire department to do that, and I'm glad of it because they came in and did the arson on the barn. But we set that camera, all of our cameras up about 100 yards from that barn. We moved them back twice because of the heat. The heat was so intense that we couldn't get, we had to keep moving back. What we didn't know was our outhouse, <laughs> our, our plastic outhouse is only 50 yards from the barn. <laughs> and, <laughs> for some reason, I walked around that end of the barn to see what was happening. It was melting down there. <laughs> so I called the fire department. I don't know, Mike, you may have helped them do it, but we drove the outhouse out just before it melted into a big pile. That barn was on the ground in about 30, no, three minutes. Yeah. Three minutes at the most from the time we set the fire, it collapsed. Unbelievable. Five fire engines in the city of Chicago <clears throat> controlled the place that they set. Nearly one third of the camp is destroyed by the fire. Ironically, the blaze delights a member of the U.S. Sanitary Commission who praises its cleansing qualities. <laughs> the immense destruction of animal life in the form of lice was wonderful. Had less of the filthy and rickety quarters been spared, greater salutary effects would have been the result. Most of the parolees are sent home by November, and General Tyler goes with them. Now here's my stills of the burning of the barn. I went in with the fire department, and they'd set it all up with incendiary devices to kick it off to where they didn't have to be in there with a match lighting some straw. But, boy, when it started, it started quick, and it didn't take long. Hmm. And it went right down. Then we moved on to the little building on it. We shot some more scenes over there. This is one of our Yankee officers. There's Matthew Govan. Matthew gets beat up pretty bad in some of these scenes. Several times, I believe, he gets beat up. Matthew is in the Army now, and he's in Germany, isn't he? Angela? Yeah. He's in the Army now, but back then he was, what, 16? Maybe? Somewhere in the neighborhood? 15, I think. Yeah, I got a little blood on him there. Uh, you saw the scene where he's thrown up against the wall and beat up. That's my son, Sean, who's in a couple scenes that particular day. John Creasy, beat up a lot during the whole thing. Everybody was beat up in this film, wasn't they? <laughs> Everybody was. Tyree gets shot, golly. And we threw people in the mud. They're getting ready. And back there behind, you see that rod, that uh, bar going across there? That's where they hung them in by the thumbs in the scene. You'll see that coming up pretty soon here. This is a scene that's coming up. It's very graphic and a very brutal scene about what went on at Camp Douglas during that time. That's Larry Crocker and Tyree Sharkley. When two is involved in this particular scene, Tyree. 
The new tone of Camp Douglas is set as soon as Morgan's men arrive. The guards had a special hatred for black rebels. There was a special animosity towards a black soldier caught in the Confederate uniform. And a black soldier caught on free soil was executed. And that happened at Camp Douglas. Uh, when the prisoners from Morgan's raid came through the gates uh, August 18th, unfortunately there was a young black slave who had been taken along on Morgan's raid. He had ridden every day that they rode. He fought every day that they fought. And he looked like a Confederate soldier. He was wearing the kepi, he had better uniform on. When he came through the gates, guards shot him to death. And the other prisoners couldn't understand. They said, what, what did he do? Why did they kill this young black soldier? And they didn't know about the unspoken rule, that any Confederate caught uh, any black Confederate caught and on free soil was forfeit. So you can see what went on at this prison camp. It was terrible the whole time, obviously. Blacks, whites, everybody got the same bad treatment one way or another. Lots of people lost their lives due to the cruelty and also the corruption that went on. These are some of my stills that I made of Tyree and, and some others as they came in. And there they said, Tyree getting shot there. Some of the men watching the, the whole thing, too. Uh, and this started the cruelty. From then on, that were, was truly beyond belief. Uh, and uh, from there, it went downhill. The, the first reports of uh, torture at Camp Douglas came from Colonel DeLand. Uh, he would hang prisoners by the thumbs in an attempt to uh, gain uh, information. Uh, so he began the ritual of torture. Uh, at Camp Douglas. The Prisoners who were forced to ride the mule, they were literally straddling this two by four <coughs> uh, piece of lumber. In order to intensify the torture, guards would uh, attach some sort of weighted material. And we built that set there, and that's just a two by six turned up on its side. And I've read where they even pointed them on the top to make it even worse than being flat. That's Glenn King sitting on that. and. That was a universal punishment throughout the army, not just Camp Douglas. Riding a horse, made it, that, that was done throughout both armies, apparently. But in this particular case, I think that uh, it talks about how feet. far beyond that they went with it. These could be bags of dirt or sand. These could be buckets uh, that were filled with uh, sand. And this obviously made the injury worse and intensified the pain of the prisoner. The prisoners were often forced to ride the mule until they passed out, many of them crippled for life. As I said when we started, Camp Douglas conditions well, okay. grew worse as the crowding became intense. And quite naturally, uh, on the part of the prison experience, it became a hellacious uh, circumstance, a hellacious experience. And quite naturally, the nickname evolved. Uh, for Camp Douglas, that it was 80 acres of hell. Well, that particular scene there was difficult to set up and do because you wanted to make it look realistic. You weren't just patting him on the back, and you can tell there he was really hitting him on the back, right? You could see the guy moving. We shot that in the upstairs of the barn, of the loft of the barn, and of course we had to protect our actor. We couldn't let him just be beat with a stick that hard because he was hitting him hard. So what we did to do it was that Morgan put a pad on his back, he tied it to his back, put it under his shirt, and then put this, not a two before, but this big uh, piece of wood upright on his back. Tied it at his, his neck and then tied it down there in his feet. Of course, you're filming from the other side so you don't see that part of it, but you see the results of him hitting that thing, and he's hitting that thing really hard. And Chris took that and did a great job of acting like he was getting killed. You can see it there with the soldier about ready to hit him. There he is from the camera angle there. Carolyn's put the blood on him already from the tying his wrist saw. And this is just a shot I made after it's over to let you know he was alive and he was fine. <laughs> he didn't die right there afterwards. Now, but at this point, at some old 63, I believe it was, Morgan's men got captured at Buffington Island and they talked about 
when they were sent to Camp Douglas, they weren't like all the other troops. They were a real cut above, and they caused more trouble than the other troops did. And this is a shot of some of Morgan's cavalrymen. And this was uh, Private Elmore Green, probably was one of those that caused all this problem, don't you think, Billy? Yeah, no, so. I've instituted some extremely severe punishments to restrain the men. Three or four days will make Camp Douglas so safe and secure that not even money can work a man out. The only danger then will be tunneling. Less than two months later, Morgan's men tunnel out of White Oak Square, digging out of their barracks to the camp fence. Hey, that caused the commandant to tear, take all the buildings that are sitting on the ground and lift them up about four feet off the ground and put posts under them so nobody could tunnel out without getting caught. That must have been quite an undertaking for the whole camp, wasn't it? These are just some portraits of some of the soldiers that played parts. Jerry, Jerry Wooten again. A lot of these fellows, I don't remember their names because they were from different parts of the country. Now here's one room in the barn. And this barn room, we turned that into this. And this was one of the hospital rooms. And they did use the horse barns in the camp. They had barns for horses as a hospital. So we felt like that this is possibly what it may have looked like. We painted those all white, hauled in straw around the bottom. Of course, we cleaned it out first. But these scenes that are shot in there are pretty graphic in the, uh, in the filming of it. But these are some of my stills that show what we did trying to make it look like the hospital and the Confederate soldiers. Prisoner P.T. Beam later recalled the Camp Douglas scurvy and the men who caused it. Lips were eaten away, jaws became diseased, and teeth fell out. If leprosy is any worse than scurvy, may God have mercy upon the victim. It was shocking, horrible, monstrous, and a disgrace to any people who permitted such conditions to exist. Union camp doctors refused to release their scurvy patients back into the prison population, since fruits and vegetables are still allowed in the hospital. Soon the hospital is packed. Between June and October, 304 more prisoners die. But Sweet is obsessed with security, not the health of his prisoners. Okay, that brings us to the next scene here, and this is one of the more fun ones to shoot too. That's Michael A.G. with a rat. <laughs> And it's well documented that they rat, ate rats at Camp Douglas because they didn't have enough food. So I'm going to show you a, a bit of take out of that cut about eating rats. Sweet orders the floors raised as a security measure to prevent tunneling. It provides the starving prisoners with an unexpected bounty. The federal uh, guards would pull the floors up. And as a soldier said, 37 years later, big, huge gray rats were caught. And uh, they made excellent rat pies. Another soldier said they were as tender as chicken. Uh, only we can only imagine the diseases that were acquired uh, uh, from these soldiers by eating these rats. And uh, yes, it occurred. Curtis Burke of Morgan's Cavalry never forgot the great rat feast. Two of the men gathered them up to clean them and to eat them. I understand that rat eating is very extensively carried on in the other squares. But my curiosity has never made me taste any rats. <laughs> no one could truly comprehend uh, the desperation of having to eat rats, but I challenge anyone to say they wouldn't do it if they were hungry enough. You'd eat anything. No, no. Rats were not the only food source for the starving rebels. <laughs> the guards had a pet dog that ate better than the prisoners. And one day the dog came up missing. Oh, baby. Lieutenant Clyde placed Pippi. a uh, uh, circular Pippi. on the, on the uh, bulletin board <laughs> by looking for the dog. And an unknown poet left a short but sweet poem that said, For lack of bread, the dog is dead. <laughs> For lack of meat, the dog is eaten. <laughs> and there's the red eater right there, favorite red eater of all. Oh, call him. Now, I do want to say that no rats were harmed in this film. <laughs> that was a squirrel that I went out that morning and shot and brought him in, and they cooked him on the spot there, and then they ate him. So, squirrel meat's probably not a lot different than rat meat at times, but cleaner anyway. Therefore, uh, prisoners were forbidden to leave their bunks at night and congregate, <coughs> even in small groups. And if they did so, uh, the guards were 
uh, ordered to be able to fire into the building where they heard unusual conversations or especially loud discussions going on. And this greatly discouraged uh, prisoners from uh, congregating or leaving their bunks. One, one prisoner even said uh, it was uh, really dangerous to snore very loudly. At Camp Douglas, this tendency to excess seemed to have increased almost exponentially so that you have consistent patterns of brutal behavior on the part of a number of prison guards, often for no reason other than their own entertainment. So you're seeing in these clips things that's documented, things that's written in the several books, there's 80 acres of hell by Levy and other things. They're not really making this up, it's really going on. So to try to get the total feel of this film, these are pretty graphic images for people to have to endure. And hopefully it'll tell a story and people will remember it. We all do. Well, from there, we moved over to Rosemont and we filmed there for several, well, the whole weekend we filmed there and got some different shots there too, interiors and exteriors on the porch of Rosemont. Now here's where you've seen Johnny as a, the poor beat up old Confederate soldier several times from eating rats and everything else. And now he's become a gentleman. Unfortunately, he's a crooked gentleman. <laughs> and he gets caught. And of course, here's Matthew. He gets caught there too in several different scenes. And Mike is always such cleaned up guy. I can't believe that he goes through this whole film. He looked like that every time we saw him. He came there that way. And John too. And Glenn King again. And there's that scene where they were searching him for uh, contraband. And the However, the Camp Douglas conspirators were tried in the city of Cincinnati. As a result, this is shot at Rosemont. they are not going to, they're going to be under public scrutiny throughout this trial. And it does bring up the question of civil liberties and how far does the government go during a time of war. Military justice is swift. The tribunals meet in Cincinnati and conclude on April 18, 1865. One of the prisoners commits suicide before the verdicts are rendered, another is sentenced to death, two others to long prison terms, and two are acquitted, including lawyer Morris. His wife, however, is banished to Kentucky. This odd sentence is the least of the bizarre constitutional contradictions in the case. Another 81 conspiracy prisoners are held at Camp Douglas without trial for five months until released at the end of the war. Twelve of them die in custody. Okay, we're coming to the end of the film now, and this is the uh, war's over, and the men are going home, and how they're released, and they get their choice. They're in Chicago now. They can either walk, or they can ride a train, or they can ride a boat. And here's what they say about that. And these scenes were shot of uh, soldiers walking across the field, and there's a real, very touching scene right at the very end that Glenn King and his daughter take part in. And that's Chelsea, that's his daughter. Think about this 13, this is 13 years ago, 2005. So she's 13 years older now. On May 8th, 1865, Sweet receives orders to release all prisoners. Those willing to take the oath of allegiance will receive free transport home. Those refusing can walk. <clears throat> Most of the Camp Douglas prisoners choose to walk. The journey home for Confederate prisoners of war, especially from Camp Douglas, was full of apprehension because they've been cut off from reliable news from home for so long. So they didn't know if their families were still there, they didn't know if their homes still existed, they didn't know if their communities were still there. They didn't know their friends whom they'd gone off to serve with in the war, how many had lived, how many had survived. And like all soldiers, they faced an incredibly uncertain future. In time, unlike its southern counterpart, Andersonville, Camp Douglas and its 6,000 victims will be forgotten. At Andersonville, in southern Georgia, where there was very little of anything, the guards would have the same as the prisoners, and many, many guards died there. But at Camp Douglas, in the land of plenty and abundance, the Confederate soldiers out of revenge or starved and tortured. Now that wraps up the film on the Camp Douglas portion of this and there's one more clip I'll play here in a moment about what happened after that at Andersonville but 
with what Tom said and what you've seen here tonight shows, documented, that the corruption and the cruelty that went on at Camp Douglas that cost so many men their lives didn't have to happen. It didn't at all. The Federals were in their own country as far north as Chicago, even though 500 prisoners during those four years, three years, escaped the other 12,000 just about in and out of the prison during that time period, endured what you saw went on in this film. Now, watch what happens at Andersonville now when the war is over. The commander of Andersonville, Major Henry Wirtz, will be executed for his actions there, but no one will ever be held accountable for the calculated cruelty at Camp Douglas. It was easy to believe the worst of a man like Wirtz, and given the position he was in with little support or oversight from Richmond, with the command of a prison compound that was with a population burgeoning far beyond its capacity to care for them, almost any man was going to fail at Andersonville. But Wirtz was a man who fit the bill of a cruel failure because simply of who he was. Contrast that with Colonel Sweet in Camp Douglas, who genuinely did inflict or at least allow the infliction of unnecessary hardships on the prisoners in his care. He had options. Words did not. Sweet, of course, will finish the war not as a hero because he's not on the battlefield, but he finishes the war as a man with commendation for a job well done. Words will finish the war at a hangman's noose. So that wraps up the film as you saw it from the beginning to the end with just clips out of it. It's an hour and 35 minutes long, you know, when you're shooting a two-hour film. I said it was an hour to start with, but I was wrong. That was a two-hour film. And uh, by the time you take out commercials, it comes down to about an hour and 35 minutes. I would recommend, if you have any interest in it, to see the whole film, because it's much better than what you're seeing in these clips here, because these are low res. But it tells a terrible story of one of the aspects that went on during the Civil War, and of course, all of us here in Gallatin know what went on in Gallatin during the war with Colonel with General Payne and the 130-something men he executed on the courthouse square during the war, too. So we have a story to tell here that's very much probably similar to what went on in this film. But the men that we had in Plummer County and Robertson County especially went to that prison, and they served in that prison. They stayed there, and they came home. Those that lived came home after the war. Thirteen months. Elmore stayed 13 months. He stayed 13 months? 13 months, months uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Walk home. Yeah, because he wasn't captured till 63, or yeah, the latter part of 63, 63, right? And so it was an interesting film to work on for me because it had its, like I said, it had its challenges. <coughs> and we can flip up the lights now if you want to. But it was a rewarding film to work on because of many of them that I've worked on with Gary, and they've all been fun to work on. This one we had to portray what these men actually might have looked like. And to do that, we had to do a lot of makeup. We had good men working, good men who stayed on this set day in and day out, never a complaint, no problems at all, as we always did. That's the reason why all of them in this room right here tonight, you know, to me, deserve accolades for making this film what it was. But I hope you enjoyed this. Have anybody got any questions about Camp Douglas or the making of a film. Now, I'm not a big time movie maker, so I can't get into the things that go on in the major, major film. My little involvement with Mohicans, I learned more in that week about the film industry and the wasting of money and the waste of time and having 10 people to do what Gary Foreman has one person to do on a set, or 20 in some cases, and what we did with it. Do they so, have many doctors? They have many what? Doctors. Did they have many doctors Camp at Camp Douglas? Douglas? I don't know how many they had, but they had them there, both Union and Confederate, captured Confederate and Union too. They couldn't take care of everybody. There was too many, too many men, too sick, too much of the time. So a lot of them died. They did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It said in that monument, six thousand people were buried here. Where is that cemetery, or where are, where were they buried? The well, Chicago area. That cemetery is in Chicago, and it's called Oakwood Cemetery. <clears throat> and of the 4,000, 6,000 that they say died and are buried, they don't even know. 
because they found that they took these bodies, and it's on it then, it was closer to the edge of the lake. They take these bodies out and throw them in shallow graves at the edge of the lake, and people would dig them up at night and throw them in the lake, and they'd just wash away. And then they had bodies washed back up on shore. And so they're missing, they accum they, they're guessing that they're missing somewhere between 1,700 and 2,000 soldiers that are unaccounted for in this grave site here. But it's the Oakwood Cemetery. And uh, they did build a monument there later on about it, and it's, uh, it's right there in down, I guess it's still downtown Chicago. Then it was out in the country. Chicago was not that far out. No kadoke, anybody else? Well, that wraps it up for me. If we got any, nobody's got any more questions, the food's right in there, by golly. Let's go ahead. <laughs> but thanks again for coming. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a little something tonight. It's been fun for me, and God bless America. <laughs>